very much, uh, Manuel. Thank you for the introduction. It's, of course, a, a great pleasure and honor for me to be invited to give a talk in this famous seminar. And I will speak about uh, vortex rings uh, for viscous fluids in the regime of large Reynolds numbers. So I, I noticed that uh, vortex rings are a popular topic in this seminar. I mean, last week there was a talk by Inji Jiang who speak about uh, head-on collisions of vortex rings in the inviscid case, and also last month by uh, Monica Musso about the leapfrogging phenomenon also in the inviscid case. So my talk will be obviously related to that, but I will consider uh, the viscous case because I'm interested in that case and also uh, only one vortex. I mean, for the moment, we are sort of behind the schedule, so we are not able to, to treat really the interaction of uh, uh, vortex rings, but already I'll try to explain what are the problems to, to define what is a viscous vortex rings in, uh, in the regime of large Reynolds number. Before I forget, I mean, let me just say that uh, this presentation all relies on joint work with uh, Vladimir Schwerak from the University of uh, Minnesota. So I have some introductory slides, but I will go over them quite quickly because this is well-known stuff. So let me maybe mention at least that vortex dynamics is certainly a field that dates back at least to the middle of the 19th century. And in particular, I have to quote the pioneering paper by uh, von Helmholtz of 1858, uh, the title of which was on the integral of hydrodynamical equation, which expressed the vortex motion. In fact, this is a title of the translation by P.G. Tate, and this work had a lot of impact uh, on, on the evolution of fluid mechanics, and in particular, it attracted the attention of people like Lord Kelvin in Edinburgh, and Kelvin has been very fascinated by the motion of, in particular, of vortex rings and the stability of these motions. It made Knight's contribution to the subject. He also uh, invented a very bizarre theory of matter, which looks completely esoteric by now. But uh, this is uh, the developments of uh, vortex dynamics in the 19th uh, century. So let me just mention a few uh, ideas of a few uh, concepts in the paper by Helmholtz. So suppose that you have uh, a a fluid that fills a three-dimensional domain, and which, which is represented by a velocity field u, which is a smooth vector field on R3, u. And you assume that a divergence of u is equal to zero. So I'm always considering incompressible fluid in this talk. And uh, you can introduce the vorticity field, which is just the curl of, uh, of u. So we have two different vector fields, in fact, the velocity field u and the vorticity omega, which should not be mixed up. So the integral curves of the velocity field are called the streamlines. And for stationary flow, they just coincide with the trajectories of the fluid particles. On the other hand, the integral curves of the uh, vorticity field are called the vortex lines. And some of the properties of these vortex lines are established in the paper by Helmholtz. For instance, Helmholtz uh, observed that the vortex lines cannot have any endpoint in the fluid. They can always be continued, extended, maybe to infinity or to the boundary of the domain, or they can make closed curve or whatever, but they cannot have endpoints. Also, um, Helmholtz consider what he called the vortex tube. Let me speak about that because I will need this notion later on. So a vortex tube, like depicted here, is a little tube made of vortex lines. And if you have a, such a vortex tube, there is a very important quantity that you can compute, which is the flux of the vorticity vector through a cross section of the tube. And this does not depend on the choice of the cross section because of Stokes theorem nowadays. Okay, so this quantity is very important because it's measure in some sense the strength of the vortex tube, and it bears several names. You can call it the vorticity flux. You can also call it the circulation of the velocity around the tube because by Stokes theorem, if you take the circulation of the velocity field along a closed curve that surrounds the vortex tube, then uh, the value of this circulation is equal to the flux of the vorticity inside the, inside the tube. Okay, as for the dynamics, uh, Helmholtz observed that if the, the fluid is driven by only potential forces, I mean, in particular, have, you have no viscosity, 
then vortex lines move with the fluid. They are just advected by the velocity field like material lines. Okay, so this is a, a nice observation. And this was reformulated by Kelvin in the form of this uh, famous circulation theorem, which is uh, recalled here. Okay, so here are a few uh, ideas from the paper by Helmholtz, but this does not give a complete description of, say, the motion of vortex tube. Assume that you have just all your vorticity, which is concentrated in such a tube. You know that the vortex line move with the fluid, but you don't have a very simple law for this motion because the velocity field, of course, is uh, determined from the vorticity by the Biot-Savart law, which is a non-local linear operator. So it's not easy, you know, it's complicated in general to, to determine the motion of a vortex tube. But there is a singular limit in which you have uh, a local uh, evolution equation. It's the case where the tube becomes very thin and degenerates into a vortex filament. So vaguely defined, a vortex filament is a very thin vortex tube for which you assume, so you, you, you send the diameter of the tube to zero, but you assume that the flux does not go to zero. So at the limit, you obtain a singular object, something like a Dirac mass supported by a curve. So if you have such a curve, parameterized say by the arc length, gamma of S, gamma is the parameterization, S is the arc length, you can try to write an evolution equation for this curve, which supports a vortex filament. And this is a famous calculation, which was done by uh, Darius in 1906, and uh, which ends up with this, what is called now the binormal flow or the local induction approximation. What Darius established in the general case is that the time evolution of this curve, dt of gamma of s, is proportional to the wedge product of ds of gamma and dss of gamma. But ds of gamma is by definition the unit tangent vector because s was the arc length parameter. And dss of gamma is the curvature of the curve times the normal vector. So if you take the wedge product here between the tangent and the normal vector, you obtain the binormal direction, which is by definition the wedge product of the tangent and the normal vector. So the time derivative of gamma is proportional to the curvature and it's directed in the binormal direction, okay? And there is also a global proportionality factor which involves gamma. So gamma is my new name for the strength of the vortex filament, which is just the flux of the vorticity inside the, the across a section of the filament. And then you have this logarithmic term, which involves the inverse of the aspect ratio of the filament. So epsilon is the thickness of the filament and L is some characteristic length, okay? And this uh, evolution here, this valid in the limit where the aspect ratio goes to zero. So epsilon over L goes to zero and this factor goes to infinity. So to leading order in this uh, regime, you have a local evolution equation where the evolution of the curve is only determined by a neighborhood of, uh, of each point. And this is this very famous uh, binormal flow or local induction approximation. Unfortunately, justifying this formula for the fundamental equation of uh, fluid mechanics is an open question, which looks very difficult, both in the inviscid case and in the viscous case. For the moment, there are only conditional results or uh, partial results in some very specific uh, settings, but no general justification of, of this motion. Now, there is a particular case of this, which is much simpler, massively simpler, I would say, where you assume symmetry around some axis. So assume now axial symmetry, you have a symmetry axis, which in this picture is the horizontal axis, but in the rest of my talk, it will be the vertical axis. And you assume that the whole flow is invariant uh, under rotation about that axis, which means that all my uh, vortex lines now are circles centered on the axis. And a uh, vortex tube is typically now a, a vortex ring. It fills the vorticity fields, a toroidal region uh, like the one which is denoted in blue here. 
and the black arrows here are, uh, denote the, the velocity field. So in that case, the binormal direction is along the symmetry axis. And if you are lucky, then you would have just due to the advection, just a, a, a uniform translation of your, um, of your vortex ring in the direction of the symmetry axis. And you can compute from the binormal formula, the advection speed, at least uh, in uh, some asymptotic regime. So the speed is given by a celebrated formula, which was derived by Kelvin, Higgs, Tyson, and many other people in the 20th century, which tells you that the advection speed is gamma. So gamma is the circulation, is again the circulation of the vortex ring, namely the flux of the vorticity vector through a section of the, the vortex ring. So gamma over 4 pi r, capital R is the major radius of the torus times log of one over epsilon plus a constant and the higher correction or order of epsilon square. And epsilon is the aspect ratio, so the minor radius over the major radius of the torus. And this is supposed to be valid in the limit where uh, epsilon goes to zero. Okay. You cannot take epsilon equal to zero, obviously, in this formula, but for epsilon small and non-zero, this is a log of one over epsilon plus a constant and the next order terms are already order of epsilon square. This constant here uh, depends on the details of the distribution of the vorticity inside of the vortex core. If you assume that the vorticity is constant inside of the support of this vortex ring, then you obtain some value of this constant C. And if you prefer having a Gaussian distribution of vorticity of whatever, then you will obtain another value of this constant. But this is the general Kelvin Higgs Dyson uh, formula. OK, so this formula can be justified uh, e more easily and has been justified in various situations. For instance, in the inviscid case, people were able to construct exact solution of the Euler of the 3D Euler equation, which are uniformly translating with a constant speed V in the laboratory frame, or if you prefer, solution which are stationary in a uniformly translating frame, and uh, the speed of the frame is given exactly by uh, this formula in the limit where epsilon goes to zero. Such kind of solutions were constructed uh, I, from the 1970s by Frankel and then by several other people I don't want to list here, using either approximation techniques or gluing methods or variational techniques. So there are a lot of work on that. So people were able to produce a lot of uh, solutions uh, for various uh, distribution of vorticities inside of the vortex core. So this is uh, basically the situation in the inviscid case. There are also results by Marchioro and collaborators, maybe I will quote some of them later, which show that for general initial data, which are sharply concentrated in a vortex ring like that, you remain for a long time concentrated like a vortex ring. These are civil, which moves with a formula of this kind. So these are different results, but in the same speed. Now, in the viscous case, uh, the point of view is different. I mean, in the viscous case, of course, there is absolutely no chance of finding exact uniformly translating solutions because these vortex ring solutions are finite energy solutions. And of course, in the viscous case, the energy, the kinetic energy is dissipated by, a vortex, by viscosity, which means that all vortex rings are eventually destroyed by diffusion, okay? So you cannot find, uh, obviously, an, an exact uniformly translating solution. But in the viscous case, uh, you have another advantage. The problem with all, it's not a problem, but a possible problem with all these studies in the inviscid case is that you have a lot of choice as for the distribution of vorticity inside the vortex core. So you don't know what to choose. You can take a constant or whatever profile looks better to you. So people were able to construct huge families, infinite dimensional families of vortex ring solutions. And so you don't know which one to choose if you want to compare with experiments. Okay, they are more or less of the same kind, but at least you have a lot of possibilities. 
in the in this, in the viscous case, there is a canonical object to consider is the object, the solution you obtain if you start with a singular vortex filament as initial data. A vortex filament is the case where the aspect ratio is equal to zero. So you said epsilon is equal to zero. Okay, so now the initial vorticity is a Dirac mass or a one current supported by a closed circle. For such initial data, of course, you cannot make sense of the Cauchy problem in the inviscid case because it will travel with infinite speed according to this formula. So a vortex filament just in the mathematical limit where you really have a singular initial data is of course something you cannot consider in the inviscid case. But in the viscous case, why not? You can do it because even if you start with something which is singular, the first thing that will happen to your solution is that it is smeared out by it is regularized by the diffusion. So if you start with epsilon is equal to zero, after a little time t, you will obtain probably something like a Gaussian vortex ring with a thickness of the order of square root of nu t, okay? And uh, which means that maybe the, the velocity of your vortex filament will be infinite at initial time, but for any positive time, it will be finite. And moreover, since the singularity was very weak here, you will have a finite displacement. So in fact, there is no conceptual obstacle to consider the Cauchy problem with a vortex filament as initial data in the viscous case. And this provides sort of a canonical object to study, which is a prototype, an archetypal example of a viscous vortex ring. So this is the point of view I would like to explore in, in this talk, okay? So this was my introduction. And uh, now I will present the result in, in, uh, in more detail. So from now on, I work in the framework of axisymmetric flows without swirl. Let me just explain what this means. So I assume that I will have a symmetry axis for my flow, which will be the vertical axis from now on. And I introduce the usual uh, cylindrical coordinates. So R is the distance to the axis, Z is the coordinate along the axis, and theta is the polar angle in the orthogonal plane, okay? And now for the velocity field, I assume that the velocity field has only two non-zero components, one in the radial direction and one in the vertical direction. And more or less, each of these components depends only on the radial variable and the vertical variable, but not on the, uh, the angle theta. So this is in fact two kinds of symmetries. This is axisymmetry in the sense that nothing depends on theta, okay? So this is axisymmetry. But for axisymmetric flows, you could have also a component in the direction of E theta. If I come back to this picture here, for an axisymmetric flow, I could have a component of the velocity field which is tangent to the torus here, okay? And not only the one which is depicted by this black arrow. This will be compatible, such a a component of the velocity field would be called the swirl, but we assume here that the swirl is zero. And if we assume that initially, this remains true for all times. So we have a, this, this is the maximal amount of symmetry we can impose, which is preserved by the equation and which contains the solution we want to construct. Okay, so assume that the vorticity field is in this form, and this is pretty much like the 2D case. In 2D case, if you consider the, the flow in a plane, you have only two uh, variables and only two components of the velocity field. So here it's basically the same, except that the uh, variables are called R and Z and not X1 and X2, okay? Now, if you take the curl of this velocity field, you discover that the, the vorticity has only one non-zero component, which is directed in the direction of E theta. So orthogonal to the velocity field. And this omega theta is given by dz ur minus the r u z, so uh, just a two-dimensional curve, okay? And finally, you have the divergence-free condition, which in cylindrical coordinates is reduced to this equation, okay? So now the, uh, the idea is to look uh, at the evolution equation satisfied by the, uh, this omega theta, which I call this uh, axisymmetric uh, vorticity. So here is the equation. 
This is the equation in the viscous case. If you are interested in the Euler equation, you should just put the right hand side to zero. So dt omega theta plus u dot grad omega theta. And then you have an additional term, which is some weak vorticity stretching effect. Okay, so you can have amplification or damping of uh, vorticity according to whether your velocity is going away from the axis or towards the, the symmetry axis. Okay, so this is what remains from the 3D vortex stretching term in, uh, in, oil, in the 3D Navier Stokes or Euler. And then you have the diffusion operator multiplied by nu, and nu is my parameter, is the kinematic viscosity. So this is this not so complicated uh, axisymmetric vorticity equation, which I want to study. Now, of course, I started from a flow in R3, but in the cylindrical coordinates, I'm back to a half plane where R should be strictly positive and Z should be anything in R. So I am solving in a half plane, which I called omega, and I need some boundary conditions on the symmetry axis. And for the vorticity, it happens that you should impose that omega theta vanishes on the symmetry axis. Okay. Now it's possible to write the nonlinear term here in a different way because since the velocity field is incompressible, dr u r plus one over r u r plus dz u z is equal to zero, it's well known that it can be written in this form in terms of a single scalar function. U r is minus one over r dz psi and u z is one over r dr psi and this function psi is called in this context the stokes stream function so this function satisfies an elliptic equation of the form minus laplacian of psi is equal to omega it's not exactly the usual laplacian in in r2 there are some geometric terms but uh, it's sort of the same spirit so you have an elliptic equation with some boundary conditions which determines the stokes stream function in terms of omega theta and once you have the stokes stream function you can compute the velocity field and plug into the equation which is therefore a closed evolution equation for omega theta okay this is all well known now we want to study some particular solutions of that equation so the first thing I have to recall is that the Cauchy problem for uh, the axisymmetric vorticity equation is globally well posed in the large. And this is a famous result from the Russian school of the 60s. There is a paper by Leidizenskaya in 68 and another by Ukovsky and Yudovich the same year, where they prove that for finite energy sufficiently smooth initial data, you have a unique global solution exactly like in the 2D case, okay? So uh, for some reason, I am not interested in finite energy solutions only because I want to start with a vortex filament and a vortex filament has infinite energy. So uh, I prefer rewriting this result in scale invariant spaces. And for the axisymmetric vorticity, the simplest scale invariant space, I mean, the most natural one is L1 of my half plane with the naive measure the two-dimensional measure dr dz. And the first result we have with Ferrac, which is nothing surprising, I would say, is that the Cauchy problem for the axisymmetric vorticity equation, which is repeated here, is globally well posed in this space here. It's exactly the analog of the well-known result, which was established by many people, including Matania Benarzi, showing that the 2D vorticity equation is globally well posed in L1, okay? So for any initial data in L1, this vorticity equation, which I rewrote here with the nonlinearity written as a Poisson bracket of the Stokes stream function and the potential vorticity. So this axisymmetric vorticity equation has a unique global solution, which is continuous in time with value in L1 and which becomes smooth for positive time. So no problem with the Cauchy problem for the, for the equation. It can be solved in the large. Moreover, the L1 norm of the solution is a strictly decreasing function of time. So in particular, it's bounded all the times by the initial data. And we have some sort of classical results about the short time and the long time behavior. This is all standard. It is all the same as in 2D, except for the claims concerning the long time behavior. The long time behavior is completely different in the axisymmetric case, completely different from the 2D case. 
but uh, all the rest is completely similar. So this is very nice, but this is not what we want because with this theorem, what we can do is to solve the Cauchy problem with such initial data. If I have a smooth vortex ring as initial data, I can continue the solution and try to, to see what, what it does, okay? But now I would like to start from a filament, as I mentioned, because I don't want to choose which kind of initial data I would like to start from. And uh, the, the vortex filament correspond to, in, I mean, in my omega theta, correspond to a Dirac mass. Here I assume omega is integrable, but L1 does not contain the Dirac mass. So I would like now to start with omega being a Dirac mass located somewhere in my half plane omega and see whether I can still solve the Cauchy problem in that case. This is not covered by this result, which was only for uh, integrable initial data. So, uh, okay, sorry, uh, psi, psi is uh, obtained from, from elliptic equation, yes? Yes, exactly. But, uh, but why there is two, two, two initial conditions, two conditions? Well, yes, why, why just not, not psi, but derivative of psi is zero uh, on the boundary? Uh, why two boundary conditions? Oh, yes, uh, it's a singular equation near the... Oh. Um, near the boundary and it happens that you have to impose both Dirichlet and Norman con boundary conditions to, to solve uh -huh, this equation. Uh -huh. Okay, this is uh, unusual, but this is due to this factor one over R squared that you have here. So, Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, okay, so this is the second result I want to mention. And uh, this uh, result is uh, of different nature. So here, uh, what we claim is the following. So let me just go to the final statement and then I will explain the history of it. So you fix the circulation of your filament, you fix the initial position. So some radius and some elevation. You can always take Z bar is equal to zero, of course, due to translation invariant. And you fix the viscosity parameter nu. Then this axisymmetric vorticity equation has a unique global solution, which is uniformly bounded in L1 and which converge weakly as t goes to zero to the filament. So this is in my new variable here. This is the expression of a single filament. It's a Dirac mass multi, uh, multiplied by some constant, which is the, the circulation and located at some point R bar, Z bar. So this is exactly in my, in my uh, uh, representation of omega theta. This is just the, the, the vortex filament. So you have existence and uniqueness for all initial data, which are just a single vortex filament of a solution which stays uniformly bounded in L1. So here, the difficulty is that you cannot do just a standard fixed point argument. I didn't mention, but the proof of the first theorem is just standard. You write the equation as an integral equation, and then you solve it locally in time by a fixed point argument in the same way as Cato told us how to do in the 60s, okay? Then you obtain some local solution and then you obtain the solution to a global one because you have a priori estimates, in particular, the one of the L1 norm. But here you cannot do the same. If you want to do a fixed point argument and prove existence and uniqueness at the same time, you end up with a smallness condition. And this smallness condition is that gamma, the circulation of the, the filament should be small compared to the viscosity parameter, which is an assumption which we can translate into saying that the Reynolds number of the initial filament is small. So for small Reynolds number in the uh, viscous regime, you can solve by a fixed point argument, but we are interested in the regime of large Reynolds number where gamma is large compared to the viscosity parameter. And in that case, the fixed point argument doesn't give you anything. It just fails, you cannot do it, okay? So you have to proceed in a different way. And for the existence, there is of course a natural approach, which is to say, oh, oh I want to take this initial data, which are singular. Let me regularize the initial data by applying say the heat kernel. So you obtain just uh, an approximation of this uh, singular initial data. For this approximation, you can apply uh, the previous theorem. You get a global solution. You get also a priori estimates, and this allows you to pass to the limit and 
when your regularization parameter goes to zero. And at the end, you obtain a solution which satisfies exactly this. And this was well done by Feng and Schwerak in the papers in 2015. Now, this doesn't give you uniqueness. And for the uniqueness, you have to work much more. This is related to stability issues of the linearized operator near a vortex ring. And this I have to explain anyway for the rest of my talk. So, OK, so this will deal with Schwerak. And we have also some information on the behavior of the solution for, more, for short time. This is a short time asymptotic expansion. You should consider here the viscosity is fixed and T sufficiently small. And it tells you what you expected is that your axisymmetric vorticity for short time looks like this quantity here. And this quantity is whatever you would have obtained by solving with this initial data, not the axisymmetric vorticity equation, but just the heat equation. This is uh, just a Gaussian viscous vortex ring with thickness equal to square root of nu t, which is the diffusion length. So for very small times, uh, the axisymmetric vorticity equation does exactly the same thing as the heat equation. It just regularizes the filament. And then uh, something different happens, which is not described by this approximation. OK? So. But nevertheless, this result is interesting because it established the existence of a four-parameter family of fundamental solutions of this axisymmetric vorticity equation. I use the term fundamental solution, which is, of course, not deserved. I mean, if you solve the heat equation with a Dirac mass, you call it this the fundamental solution. So we solve the, this axisymmetric this nonlinear equation with a Dirac mass as initial data. And we call this also some fundamental solution. Now, due to all the symmetries, in fact, you don't have a really four parameters. I mean, they can all be obtained by uh, rescaling. So the only non-trivial parameter is the Reynolds number, which is gamma divided by nu. The circulation divided by the viscosity, this is the only parameter you cannot eliminate by scaling, dilation, and things like that. OK. Now, uh, we would like to investigate what is the qualitative behavior of this solution, not only for short time, but for uh, a fixed interval of time. Because this formula here does not uh, show any motion of the vortex ring. You compare the solution to a vortex ring located at the initial position, which is bad. We know that the vortex ring will move, but we don't see it from that formula. OK, so obviously this result is not satisfactory and we want a better result. So to obtain this result, maybe I should just explain what I mean physically by this uh, regime of large Reynolds number. I mean, if you consider a vortex a filament, of circulation gamma and initial radius r bar, there are at least two different time scales in the problem. The third time scale is what I call the advection time, which is r square over gamma, is the time needed for your vortex filament to travel over a distance which is comparable to the major radius. It's the time on which you see really a vortex ring move. I mean, if, if you observe, at, at, uh, at a time which is so short that the, more, the vortex doesn't move, it's not interesting. So we would like to see the vortex ring moving on a, dis on a distance which is comparable to its radius. And this, uh, this is OK if you can wait until this advection time given by this formula. But there is another time scale which is related to diffusion. If you start with a singular vortex filament, it will not stay singular, but it will be, be regularized by diffusion it will become a vortex ring of thickness square root of nu t approximately. But square root of nu t grows, grows, and at some time it becomes of the same order as the major radius of the vortex. And this is the diffusion time, which is r square of a nu. So this is a time at which the vortex ring is completely destroyed by diffusion. You start from a filament, it becomes a very thin vortex ring, and then it becomes a, a fat donut. And then finally, everything is destroyed by diffusion. OK? So the regime, the regime of large Reynolds number is when nu is much less than gamma, in which means that the advection time is much less than the diffusion time. The vortex ring will travel a long, long, long distance before being destroyed by diffusion. The converse regime, where you are highly viscous, 
you have only that the vortex ring is immediately destroyed by diffusion without having time to move. And this is, of course, not the interesting case. So large Reynolds number means that you will see the vortex ring move before the diffusion destroys it. Okay. So this is a regime I will consider in the rest of my talk. And let me just mention that I will have two small parameters in my expansions, delta, which is nu over gamma, which is the inverse Reynolds number. So this goes to zero because we consider the large Reynolds number regime. And epsilon, which is a time-dependent parameter, square root of nu t divided by r bar. This is the aspect ratio of my vortex ring. I mean. Square root of nu t is whatever you produce with the heat equation when you start from a Dirac mass. You produce a blob of, of uh, standard mean deviation square root of nu t. So this is the diffusion length divided by the radius of the vortex. Okay. So whenever this is small, you have a thin vortex ring. Okay. Now let me try to explain the final result, which is of course not the easiest to read. Uh, so uh, this is also a collaboration with Vladimir Sferak, but it's not yet posted on archive. It's written, but not polished. We are polishing it soon. Um, I hope it will appear uh, soon. OK, so let's fix the circulation, the initial position of my uh, filament, which I now de denote by r bar 0 and z bar 0. And for any small viscosity, I consider omega nu which is the unique solution of the axisymmetric vorticity equation provided by the previous theorem, I mean, which is uniformly bounded in L1 and which converges to the filament as t goes to zero. And now I claim that I have these improved estimates. I can control the solution all the way from zero to the advection time or even any multiple of the advection time, but at least of this order. So it is a scale on which my, uh, vorte my vortex ring will travel quite a lot. And uniformly in the viscosity, I can compare my solution, my exact solution, with what is easily recognized as a viscous vortex ring with Gaussian vorticity profile, which is located not at the initial position because it's impossible, it moves, but at some different position given by r bar of t and z bar of t. And this function, we don't know them explicitly, but you know that r bar of t is more or less constant because nu is very small, but the vertical speed is exactly given by this Kevin Hicks Dyson formula, gamma or the time dependent version of it, gamma over four pi times the radius, time log of the inverse aspect ratio, which is now time, time dependent. In the inviscid case, this was a fixed parameter, my epsilon. Here now it's a, it's a time dependent quantity, plus this constant V, and this V can even be computed explicitly in terms of the Euler's constant and logarithm of two or whatever. And this gives you exactly two leading order uh, the, the vertical displacement of the vortex ring. So I can justify now this Kelvin Hicks uh, Dyson formula, which I, this has been justified by people working in the inviscid case. Now we have another justification of the same formula to the same order in the viscous case, just by solving the Navier-Stokes equation with a vortex filament as uh, initial data. Okay. And uh, let me make another comment here. I have some uh, approximation here. This is fake. I mean, the, uh, maybe it's epsilon to some power gamma with gamma less than one, because there is not only epsilon, but there are some power of log of one over epsilon. So this is not completely correct, but this is the, the shortest distance to a correct formula I could write that would fit into my, my line. Okay. OK, so uh, this is a result uh, that we would like to present. And let me mention, OK, I wanted to mention something, is that I control the solution, say, from 0 to the advection time. But over that time, if I compute the total displacement, I obtain a quantity which goes to infinity as nu goes to 0 because of this logarithm factor here. So I really control the solution over a very, very long time. And this time is longer than what uh, is done in the papers by Mark Yoro and collaborators for general concentrated initial data. And it's also longer 
than uh, the time scale which is used in by uh, Davila, Delpino, Musso, and Way for the leapfrogging in the inviscid case. But of course, this is in the viscous case where I have the viscosity which I can use, and this is only for one vortex filament and not yet for the interaction of several vortex filaments. But I wanted to mention that we control it over very long time, time scale. Okay, so in the remaining, say, 10 minutes, uh, or five to 10 minutes, let me explain a little bit what this EID to, to prove this result, but unfortunately, it's not simple. Let me skip that, unfortunately. So the first step is to introduce coordinates which desingularize the vortex at initial time, because we start from impossibly singular initial data, so we, uh, we center the new coordinates at the location of the vortex, which is unknown. It's an unknown of the problem. And we measure the distance in terms of the diffusion length. So we introduce these self-similar coordinates. And more precisely, this uh, axisymmetric vorticity is, uh, is uh, written in the form gamma over new t times a new function of the new coordinates and the Stokes stream function like gamma r bar times a new function phi of the new coordinates. So we go to the self-similar coordinates and the new vorticity is eta, the new stream function is phi. And then you obtain a modified, a rescaled evolution equation, which is uh, just obtained by, uh, is just the translation of this equation in the new coordinates. They have time derivative, nonlinearity, diffusion terms. You have exactly the same structure here, sort of time derivative, the nonlinearity, some additional terms which are due to the fact that I translated the, the origin of my frame to some unknown points. So there are the velocity of this point which involved here, and these are the diffusion terms here. Okay. And now, I have to solve this equation, but I cannot solve this equation with arbitrary initial data because this is no longer really a Cauchy problem because of this term, but I can solve it exactly if the initial data is a Gaussian, e to the minus r square plus z square over four. In that case, this equation is zero at initial time. So my initial data are no regular. I don't start from a vortex filament. I start from a regular, function as initial data, and I would like to control the solution of this equation uniformly in the viscosity as the viscosity goes to zero. But the problem, as you see, is that this equation involves gamma of a new, so when the viscosity goes to zero, all these terms are very singular. So it's not clear at all that you can control this uniformly in new, at least uh, it's not obvious. Okay. So the first step is desingularization of the equation. Okay, now that we have a regular equation, we do not try to solve it immediately because it's too complicated. We build an approximate solution. An approximate solution, okay, let me skip all that. We build an approximate solution as a power series in my parameter, parameter epsilon. And I recall that the parameter epsilon was the aspect ratio, the thickness of the filament divided by the, the, the radius, okay? So the leading order term is known. I mean, as I mentioned, the only initial data I can take for my, my equation are just the Gaussian vorticity. And this is the corresponding stream function obtained by solving the two-dimensional Biosavarlo. So the leading order term, both for the vorticity and for the stream function is known. And now you would like to prove, uh, to find the first order term and the, the second order correction and so on, okay? So I don't think I have time to explain all this in detail, but uh, let me mention a few points. Uh, the, the, the velocity of the, of the vertical position and of the radius, the, the change of the radius are not known either. So we also construct a power series expansion and try to, to find these quantities order by order. So the leading order is known. What is the equation for uh, the next order? So let me skip one slide. We obtain some equation like that, which you cannot read because I didn't introduce the notation. So in the right-hand side, you have only known quantities. And in the left-hand side, you have my profile eta1, and you have some linear operators acting on it. 
So forget about this term because we want to solve it uniformly in the viscosity. And when the viscosity is very small, this term is very small. So you have some linear operator acting on eta one should be equal to that. But it happened that this linear operator, which I have no time to define, but it's the same operator I used in my papers with Wayne on the stability of the 2D vortices. Uh, this has not a full range. I mean, you cannot solve it with arbitrary initial data. You have solvability condition to impose. And if you impose this solvability condition here, this exactly amounts to fixing the leading order of the vertical speed. So the only thing I wanted to say at this stage is that you can solve this equation but the velocity field, the velocity of the vortex ring, I mean, exactly this uh, Dyson, uh, no, this Kelvin Higgs Dyson formula is obtained as a solvability condition when you try to, to construct the first non trivial order in your uh, approximation of the viscous vortex ring. You find exactly with exactly the same constant and so on. So if you impose that value of the vertical speed, you can invert and you find exactly the next order profile eta one and phi one. And then you continue and at each order, you can, by adapting a little bit the vertical speed and other details, you can find order by order in principle without any limit, an approximate expansion, uh, an approximate solution as a power series in a power emitter epsilon. So you can construct some approximation of the solution you are looking at, which is more and more precise in, tech and in terms of this small parameter epsilon. Okay, now suppose that you have carried out all this construction, you obtain some approximate solution to some high order. I need fourth order, in fact, in my, in my construction, which I call eta star. And now you look for the exact solution as the approximation plus a remainder. Okay. This is exactly the same idea what you, you, that you use when you do I mean, stability of boundary layers. You, compare, you, you first construct an approximation to some high order, and then you try to, to look for your solution, like your approximation plus a small correction. This is exactly the same we do here. The same for uh, the vorticity and the stream function. And now you consider the equation for the remainder, which is the only quantity uh, you have to find. And this remainder, this correction eta tilde satisfies a very similar equation as before, except that the nonlinearity now has been expanded because uh, it's a nonlinear term. And you solve with zero initial data because all the initial data are contained here in eta star, but you have now a source term, which is this term remainder. And this remainder is measures by how far your approximate solution failed to be an exact solution of the problem. If, if this was an exact solution, this remainder would be zero. So the solution of this will be zero, but this is not the case, but we constructed a very precise approximate solution. So that if you construct to a sufficiently high order in epsilon, epsilon to some large power, then this term is zero, even when you divide it by Delta, which is small also. So you construct the approximate solution in such a way that the source term in the equation for the remainder is small enough. And now you have to solve this equation with zero initial data with a source term and to control the solution uniformly in the vanishing viscosity limit. And this is still a big problem because in this equation, you still have one over delta. So even though you start with zero initial data and you have a small source term, you could have a very rapid exponential amplification, and maybe you are not able to control the size of this eta tilde on a, on a time interval, which is independent of the viscosity, okay? So in order to do that, you have to see that these terms here are in fact harmless. And this, uh, you have to exploit some cancellation and some symmetries or skew symmetries of this operator. I don't have to, uh, time to explain, but, what we use is a non-local functional uh, in terms of this uh, correction of the vorticity eta tilde. So you have some weighted entropy estimates with some weight which has to be carefully controlled. And then you have to have a non-local part, which is just the kinetic energy. And this functional cannot be guessed so easily, but this is related to Arnold variational characterization of steady state of the Euler equation. So those of you who have heard the Vladimir Shverak explaining 
all that one year ago in the same seminar may remember how this uh, appear. And we use exactly this non-local energy functional in order to control the evolution of this equation. Obviously, I have no time to give the detail, but it's possible by some recipe, which are not black magic. I mean, they have some logic to construct a weight here in such a way that this energy has a good properties. When you compute the time derivative, you get lots of terms, but the only uh, nasty term are those for which you have the viscosity in the denominator, and you can now choose the weight in such a way as these terms are basically zero. Okay, let me just uh, do it like that. Here, the way to choose the weight. So the weight is quite complicated. It has some Gaussian parts, some plateau, some sub Gaussian part, and so on. This is just technical stuff, but it's possible to find a weight in such a way that now just applying energy estimate to that equation, you see that over a time interval of order of one, this eta tilde remains of the same order as its reminder. So it remains small. So when we go back to this equation, this tells you that your true solution is your approximation plus very small reminder. And this gives you, when you go back to the original variable, exactly this result here, except that you don't have it in L1 norm, but in a much stronger norm. This is, again, something which was uh, chosen so as to be readable, uh, more or less. But we have, of course, we don't, not only we have this approximation, but we know exactly how the vortex ring deforms to leading order, we can really, we really have a, an asymptotic expansion of the solution in the vanishing viscosity limit over a very long time interval. And I suppose I'm out of time since uh, a few minutes, so uh, I have to stop here and I thank you for your attention.